Dan Radio Style. Hope everybody out there is having themselves a great day. Assumption becomes facts. It's the second chapter of Out of This World. Neville Goddard rocking it again. Really pushing consciousness always throughout and through, through and through, throughout this whole wonderful set of books. But in this particular one, there's four basic things that kind of jumped out at me. One, the title, Assumption Becomes Facts. Very important to understand that the whole concept of assumption is really what's going to get us over any hump, any obstacle, any sort of thing that's going on. Assume there's a way forward. Assume there's a way for your dream to come true. Assumption's key. Gotta have some of that, and it'll save your bum many, many, many times. Also, we must believe we already are and have what we desire. That's kind of something that is tricky, is hard for some to understand, and I think just some people just straight up don't do it. But understanding that you must be it already. There's no, you kind of are, or you do it for a second and then stop. No, you got to be it, always. And some of declaring something and saying, this is what I'm going to become, and this is what I am, this is what I desire, like however it ends up being phrased, and you decide that you're on a path, a quest to get, become, have this thing then you start taking steps forward towards it. Like, period, doesn't matter. I'm going towards it. I don't care what happens. I don't care what I have to deal with. I'll cross that bridge when I get there. But fact of matter, I grab my pack, threw it over my shoulder, and I'm on my way. Number three, the attractiveness comes from within us. It is truly kind of within us that the attractive pull, if you will, or the push from us towards what it is that we desire through experiences, and that's something that Neville kind of plays with in this book, by the way, is the serialization of reality, the way we experience life from moment to moment to moment, from experience to experience to experience. You don't just go from here to there. You've got a number of steps that happen in between, or what some of us call the unfolding or the way it is happening, right? There's a, there's a process where Space and time seem to have to come into play. And finally, controlled waking dream. That's really his big point in this whole chapter uh, is the con controlled waking dream really being the key to how we manifest. And I agree 100%, but I also would like to expand it because I think that's kind of a cool 60s term. But I think really what it is is controlled meditation. You don't just have to do this in bed when you're falling asleep. No, you can like do a meditation when the sun shines out. You can go out into a field with grass and get all, you know, comfortable and, um, you know, and get yourself into that place. So I think it's important to understand that we can get to this place any time of day, any place we're at, no matter what. Because a lot of people, I think, get hung up on the fact that it really needs to be at night before I go to bed. Shoot, man, because I, I can't really do that. I, You know, whatever reason. But maybe there's some moment where you got five minutes, ten minutes, an hour during the day where you can do whatever you'd like. And that's the perfect time to start doing it. So chapter two, assumptions become facts. Men believe in the reality of the external world because they do not know how to focus and condense their powers to penetrate its thin crust. This book has only one purpose, the removing of the veil of the senses, the traveling into another world. To remove the veil of senses, we do not employ great effort. The objective world vanishes by turning our attention away from it. We have only to concentrate on the state desired in order to mentally see it, but to give it reality so that it will become an objective fact, we must focus attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality. When, through concentrated attention, our desire appears to possess the distinctiveness and feelings of reality, we have given it the right to become a visible concrete fact. It is difficult to control the direction of your attention while in a state akin to sleep, you may find gazing fixedly into an object fairly helpful. Do not look at its surface, but into and beyond any plain object such as a wall, a carpet, or any other object which possesses depth. Arrange it to return as little reflection as possible. Imagine, then, that in this depth you are seeing and hearing what you want to see and hear until your attention is exclusively occupied by the imaginal state. This is kind of the place where you can let things kind of get fuzzy. I think that's what he's trying to help is the way you can sort of almost kind of fuzzy your eyes to sort of zone out for a moment. 
And it's that kind of zoning out concept that I think he's really talking about. You know, and in meditative state, that's kind of similar, right? You get yourself to this place where you're not really conscious of what's around you. You kind of go into this weird kind of place, right? It's a little strange. He continues. At the end of your meditation, when you awake from your controlled waking dream, you feel as though you had returned from a great distance. The visible world, which you had shut out, returns to consciousness and by its very presence informs you that you have been self-deceived into believing that the object of your contemplation was real. But if you know the consciousness is the one and only reality, you will remain faithful to your vision and by this sustained mental attitude confirm your gift of reality and prove that you have the power to give reality to your desires that they may become visible, concrete facts." Define your ideal and concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal. Assume the feeling of being it, the feeling that would be yours were you already the embodiment of the ideal. Then live and act upon this conviction. I want to stop right here. Then live and act upon this conviction. So you create this reality. You create this place that you are going to inhabit, that you are now it is you now. You already have it now. You then live and act upon this conviction, which means you believe it inside. You take choices and act according to things that will get me to this place. Define your ideal and concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal. Assuming the feeling of being it, the feeling that would be yours were you already the embodiment of the ideal. Then live and act upon this conviction. This assumption, though denied by the senses, if persisted in, will become fact. You will know when you have succeeded in fixing the desired state in consciousness by simply looking mentally at the people you know. In dialogues with yourself, you are less inhibited and more sincere than in actual conversations with others. Therefore, the opportunity for self-analysis arises when you are surprised by your mental conversations with others. If you see them as you formerly saw them, you have not changed your concept of self, for all changes of concept of self result in a changed relationship to your world. In your meditation, allow others to see you as they would see you were this new concept of self a concrete fact. You always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. Therefore, in meditation, when you contemplate others, you must be seen by them mentally as you would be seen by them physically, were your concept of self an objective fact. That is, in meditation, you imagine that they see you expressing that which you desire to be. Key to this part is whenever we're doing manifestations and we're trying to create something, and if by chance specific people are a part of these manifestations, maybe it's a boss, maybe it's a specific person, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's someone you work with, whatever the case is, if they're specific people, you need to make sure that you understand you see them as the way that, one, you want them to change. So if they need to change, you need to see them in your mind. When you're talking with them, they're already changed. They're already fixed. Or... If they need to see you a different way, maybe your boss is upset with you right now and you need him to see you differently, then you need to have that expressed within your visualization as well. So when your boss reflects to you or says things to you within your imagination, this problem apparently no longer exists because now he's giving you a promotion, right? Because now he's saying things like, I'm really glad you were able to step past that mistake you made. You've really become a much better person because there is value, by the way, in making errors and growing from them and owning up to them. And in a lot of cases, you gain respect. Now, if you do it often, it kind of sucks, but you gain respect by doing it. Goddard continues. If you assume that you are what you want to be, your desire is fulfilled, and in fulfillment, all longing is neutralized. You cannot continue desiring what you already realized. Your desire is not something you labor to fulfill. It is a recognizing something you already possess. It is assuming the feeling of being that which you desire to be. Believing and being are one. The conceiver and his conception are one. Therefore, that which you conceive yourself to be can never be so far off as even to be near, for nearness implies separation. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Being is that substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. If you assume that you are what you want to be, 
then you will see others as they are related to your assumption. This part's really important to kind of keep in mind the desire part. Once you have a desire, the desire leads you to what you need, what you want to take steps towards, the thing that you should start to focus on and create an imaginal scene around. Once you've got that imaginal scene, once you've felt it and gotten to the point where I feel it as though it is real, you let go of it. And from that point, it really shouldn't be a desire anymore is what he's saying, because you don't desire something you already have. I don't desire this book. I don't keep buying this book over and over and over. I love this book, I read it often, but I don't desire it because I have it already. Once you have manifested your desire, your dream already, you've created it in your mind, and now you're saying, I have this already, your desire for it should not continue. And when it does, and it's not that you don't want to experience it, but you don't feel this longing for it, you don't feel this loss of it. You don't feel the separation of it. And that's really where he gets into the different ways that we separate ourselves, where we don't believe we quite have it, or maybe it's tomorrow. Like we have a hard time believing that it is within us now. It's in our minds. It's in our heart. It's in our soul. And it will be in our physical world because of it's already in our heart, mind, soul, and crystallizing currently. Like you already have it. It's just dripping into physical reality uh, slower than maybe you want to uh, experience it. If, however, it is the good of others you desire, then in meditation you must represent them to yourself as already being that which you desire them to be. It is through desire that you rise above your present sphere and the road from longing to fulfillment is shortened as you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you already the embodiment of the ideal you desire to be. I have stated that man, at every moment of time, the choice before him, which of several futures he will encounter. But the question arises, how is this possible when the experience of man, awake in the three-dimensional world, are predetermined, as his observation of an event before it occurs implies? This ability to change the future will be seen if we liken the experience of life on earth to this printed page. Man experiences events on earth singly, and successively in the same way that you are now experiencing the words on this page. Imagine that every word on this page represents a single sensory impression. To get the context, you understand my meaning, you focus your vision on the first word on the upper left-hand corner, and then move your focus across the page from left to right, letting it fall on the word singly and successively. By the time your eyes reach the last word on this page, you have extracted my meaning. Suppose, however, on looking at the page, with all the printed words thereon equally present, you decided to rearrange them. You could, by rearranging them, tell an entirely different story. In fact, you could tell many different stories. This is what he's saying, where we take the words on the page and arrange them the way we want them. We create what we experience by what we declare, what we decide. This is how it's going to be. It is going to be this way. Everything, get in alignment, and let's get on our way towards it. He continues, A dream is nothing more than uncontrolled four-dimensional thinking, or the rearrangement of both past and future sensory impressions. Man seldom dreams of events in the order in which he experiences them when awake. He usually dreams of two or more events which are separated in time, fused into a single sensory impression, or... In his dream, he so completely rearranges his single waking sensory impressions that he does not recognize them when he encounters them in his waking state. For example, I dreamed that I had delivered a package to a restaurant in my apartment building. The hostess said to me, you can't leave that there. Whereupon the elevator operator gave me a few letters as I thanked him for them. He in turn then thanked me. At this point, the night elevator operator appeared and waved and greeted to me. The following day, as I left my apartment, I picked up a few letters which had been placed at my door. On my way down, I gave the day elevator operator a tip and thanked him for taking care of my mail, whereupon he thanked me for the tip. On my return home that day, I overheard a doorman say to the delivery man, you can't leave that there. As I was about to take the elevator up to my apartment, I was attracted by a familiar face in the restaurant, and as I looked in, the hostess greeted me with a smile. Late at night, I escorted my dinner guests to the elevator, and as I said goodbye to them, the night operator waved goodnight to me. 
by simply rearranging a few of the single sensory impressions I was destined to encounter, and by fusing two or more of them into a single sensory impression, I constructed a dream which differed quite a bit from my waking experience. When we have learned to control the movements of our attention in the four-dimensional world, we shall be able to consciously create circumstances in the three-dimensional world. We learn this control through the waking dream, where our attention can be maintained without effort, for attention minus effort is indispensable to changing the future. We can, in controlled waking dream, consciously construct an event which we desire to experience in the three-dimensional world. Now here, of course, he's painting the picture of all we have to do is create the opposite from having a dream show us what's going to happen to creating the dream ourselves so we experience it. We're influencing life by, by telling life, here's what I'd like to experience, by feeling it, thinking it, having it already, becoming it, and holding that feeling, holding that understanding, holding that presence, holding that knowing. And as you hold that day after day after day, as you put on those new shoes and keep wearing them time after time, you break them in, they get comfortable, and that becomes normal. Now, once you get to that feeling, you manifest a completely different world. When you can bump your consciousness up a level, trust me, you almost immediately begin to see things. Like suddenly you're like, yeah, I'll buy a couple scratchers and you like win a hundred bucks. You're like, what the heck? Like you'll just, it's just like everything works out for you. When you bump yourself up to that consciousness, your entire life can change in an instant. The sensory impressions we use to contrast our waking dreams are present realities displaced in time or the four-dimensional world. All that we do in constructing the waking dream is to select from a vast array of sensory impressions, those which, when they are properly arranged, imply that we have realized our desires. With the dream clearly defined, we relax in a chair and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep, a state which, although bordering on sleep, leaves us in conscious control of the movements of our attention, which is why I kind of think it's similar to meditation too. When we have achieved that state, we experience in imagination what we would experience in reality were this waking dream an objective fact. In applying this technique to change the future, it is important always to remember that the only thing which occupies the mind during the waking dream is the waking dream, the predetermined action which implies the fulfillment of our desires. How the waking dream becomes physical fact is not our concern. Our acceptance of the waking dream as physical reality wills the means to its fulfillment. Let me once again lay the foundation of changing the future, which is nothing more than a controlled waking dream. First, define your objective. Know definitely what you want. Second, construct an event which you believe you will encounter following the fulfillment of your desire, something which will have the action of self-predominant or event which implies the fulfillment of your desire. Third, immobilize the physical body and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep. Then, mentally feel yourself right in the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now so that you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you now to realize your goal. Much like pretending, make-believe. Isn't that the whole point of childhood make-believe is to do something like it's actually real? And to them it is, right? That's exactly all we're doing. We're making believe to the best of our ability so that we feel it. So it becomes real in our mind for right now at this moment. So I experience it right now and I know what that feels like. That shifts your consciousness. So now you know what it feels like. That's the feeling that you need to attain. That feeling you felt when you were living in the moment, when you were being the thing you desire. Finally, experience has convinced me that this is the perfect way to achieve my goal. However, my own many failures would convict me were I to imply that I have completely mastered the movements of my attention. I can, however, with the ancient teachers say, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize. One of the greatest things about what Goddard shares with us here is mastering our attention. Mastering our attention and understanding that that truly is the key to creation. One of the things that's made a big difference for me is being able to put my attention onto something that helps me realize that my goals are becoming 
what I believe they are. I've talked about the mirror technique. I still use that as well. But you can do this in this meditative state. It's very similar. You're just not looking yourself in the eyes, which can be a little weird to some people, frankly. But it's all similar. And what it is, is self-discussion, self-dialogue, that's meant to get ourselves to realize we already are what it is we desire. A couple examples. Someone I maybe want to have a relationship with. So maybe I might say things like, he is attracted to me already. He is thinking about me often. He keeps having moments where I keep popping into his head. He looks at me fondly. He thinks that I'm a wonderful person. He seems to think I feel like I feel good to him. And we say these things to ourselves so we, one, realize we already are attractive to them, to this other person. We already are the thing that they desire for sure. And certainly, they apparently are already the thing that you desire. And if there's some caveats that you'd like to see, then again, he talks about how we should see them that way as well. See them from the vantage point of that they care about me deeply, that they're only interested in me. Uh, I am the monogamous choice, or I am the person they want to have a family with and spend all their time with. I'm the one they want to go on vacations with. Be all those things and make sure that you're expressing it from the standpoint of right now, I am these things right now. And two, that there are things that indicate the outcome that you desire is happened. Right, So if you're wanting love from this individual, all these things that I just stated definitely imply that you've got something going on or that there's a relationship. Maybe you're trying to be a boss right, or trying to get a boss to see you differently. Maybe trying to get a boss to see your accomplishments. My boss sees my accomplishments. My boss is realizing how much I've risen and grown in the past months. My boss has realized how far I've come. My boss realizes the success I did on the Johnson Project or whatever right? These things are getting attention from my boss. I am getting noticed by people in the right places. Like saying these things to ourselves and realizing that right now I am getting noticed. Yeah, your promotion's what you're trying to manifest, sure. But right now I'm being noticed. That's what I am right now. That's what I'm taking to the table and basically saying my my outcome is guaranteed because I am the thing that they're looking for. What about... Instagram success, right? You got an Instagram page and you're, I am successful. I am making Instagrams. I am putting out what people want to see. I am putting out the proper content that people are loving. They are loving the content that I keep putting out on my Instagram. And what you'll find is that will help push you to the proper topics, to the proper goals, to the proper websites, to the proper, it will help guide you. When we state that this is what I am already, The stepping stones to our future begin to form and we start stepping onto them and we start going to the right websites and we start doing things just kind of naturally, almost maybe even unconsciously sometimes. But when you stay focused on where you're going, these inevitable outcomes will show up. There's someone particularly you're trying to get in your life. Know that they are thinking of you. Know that you are all the things that they are interested in right now. If you're trying to get a better job, trying to get more income, understand that you're already the things that would help bring about more income. I am wealthy. I am abundant. I am lucky if you're playing the lottery all the time. I am always a winner. Whatever the thing is that you're going down that path, make sure that you are it already. And make sure you declare that on a regular basis. Get yourself into that place where that energy, where you feel it like you have it already and use that feeling to help get you day to day, to help keep your energy at that same place. You keep feeling that same way. Your dreams start to trickleize and crystallize into your reality. And that's a pretty freaking good day at the office, isn't it? Dan Radio style.